Okay, good evening, gentlemen. Welcome to both of you back to Iblis Manifestations, but this time as a first time uh, together. And this is actually the first episode I've ever done with two other people. And honestly, I couldn't have picked another better combo of people to do this with, you know? So not only are the both of you um, two of my favorite frontmen, musicians that I know, but also people who I've shared the stage with, had the honor to do so. Uh, Bjorn multiple times, uh, unfortunately for you. Uh, <laughs> but also, both of you are people who I consider very good friends. So, welcome to the show. Um, how have you both been since uh, we've been to London? I guess we can start with Dagur at the moment. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I've i uh, been really fucking busy and... Uh... Recently, I I, I I got a cold like after our last trip. We were at a festival in in Holland last weekend, and I got home and just have been in bed since. But I'm getting better now, so it's cool. Uh, nothing much more happening. Just uh, always occupied with some nonsense. Great stuff. And how are you doing, Bjorn? Yeah, same. Just staying busy between yeah running around doing everything all the time so trying to make ends meet and uh, get as much done as possible yeah yeah well it definitely looks like it man i mean i gotta say man guys like the fucking london was such a blast you know it was so cool to share the stage together but especially as such a killer venue and i feel like everyone just performed so fucking well you know i mean you know, we had the O2 Academy, you know, the venue was a bit of a fucking maze, but, you know, it was like... Yeah, they, they... it was really cool. It's a really yeah. nice evening. Probably yeah, the best true. Trivex gig I've ever seen, too, as well. Strong. Same for me. I, I really it's, a, it's the only that. time I saw you, actually, but... <laughs> 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 no, well, that's probably okay, you know, because I, I tend to agree with Bjorn, but, but thank you, man. I really appreciate it. I mean, it, you know, it couldn't go wrong, you know, 800 capacity sold out you know like one of the best lineups you can have in london i think you know and even if we weren't a part of it i think it was still an event i would have definitely not missed you know and uh, yeah it was just cool to fucking hang out and and shoot the shit uh, yeah. and I, th I thought it was especially cool that uh dogger and, and miss thurming decided to end their set with overkill that was pretty fucking yeah. iconic <laughs> sneaky bastards i know no it was a, it was a nice little touch there uh I guess, uh, you know, there's like so many different things that, that we can cover here, you know, and, uh, and and obviously both of you have actually collaborated together before, you've performed tours in the past, and you actually have tours coming up, you know. So I think we'll get into all of that, but one thing that I'm really curious to actually start with, you know, just because it's quite a fresh and recent event, is Bjorn, you recently just performed in Israel, yes. and literally moments after that the, the whole country is is in chaos because of the uh, attacks by hamas which happened now yeah. one particular aspect of this which is very fascinating is not just the fact that you went over and did a show because it was a part of a festival you know obviously darwaza played Aklis played you know it was a killer lineup but it's the fact that you and uh, another good friend of ours uh, uh, christopher from necros horns you went and actually did a photo shoot behind Via Dolorosa in uh, in Israel, in, in Tel Aviv. And this was merely f just, what, a few hours before the attacks happened? Yeah, it was around uh, probably like five or six hours before it happened. I, I think I left on the last plane that that uh, was able to go out. So I didn't know anything until I landed in uh, Denmark. So I just got out. So, yeah, we were in Jerusalem, yeah, five or six hours before that. I mean, so. if I may paint a picture for anyone listening here, imagine that obviously Tel Aviv, you know, and, and that, that area of the world is, 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 a, is a holy place, you know, and, and that's, a, yeah. that's, a, that's a sacred place for a lot of people, uh, not even necessarily just the Jewish faith, but I would say probably uh, to everyone involved, at least in, in the monotheistic religions, that's a holy land, you know, that's what it's, it's always been looked at, you know, historically and religiously, I would say. So, <laughs> of, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of laughing at it just because it's fucking extreme, you know, but it's like, you know, you've got people there who've never seen anything like what they're about to witness, 
which is basically you uh, in your full stage gear and full corpse paint appearing there in a place where no one else has ever appeared there like that before, so which I would consider it in black metal history. I think that's a very prominent moment. And you've got all these religious people. There's that particularly iconic photo of the woman in hijab staring at you whilst on the phone and you're completely in the zone doing your thing, you know, like a complete demonic manifestation that, you know, that that, that can become. And and then merely like a few hours later, their country is, you know, basically gets attacked in the most horrendous way possible. And I mean, if that's not an omen, I don't know what it is. I mean, how do you feel to be at, at the center of, of such a weird thing? Yeah, it just feels very weird that that actually happened. But also to have been there with all the history, just to... As I am the king of bad ideas, I just had to do it right. Just uh, can't let that chance go away and then willing to take the chance and actually do it for real and... Pretty stressful, but I'm happy uh, we pulled through and did it. What were some so, yeah. of the interactions that, that you were getting whilst you were there? Yeah, I just uh, locked it out when we took the pictures. I just locked it out and we just went for it. But remember, we've been walking around there like the whole day. And sometimes when you pass people, they just tell you, disgusting, you know, go away. And, like, so you have your eyes on us all the time. Right. There's a, one guy that stopped me and asked, what is, what is with the attire? Why, why do you look like this? I'm like, well, I'm me. Why do you look like you do? Oh, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I'm Orthodox me. And then he just left. Nice. Wow. So we had eyes on us all the time. And uh, yeah, the police was around. So it was pretty stress stressful, but just went for it. Sure. I mean, do you, do, you have, do you have thoughts of, like, what could have happened had you stayed a little bit longer? Because that, that's that's cutting it pretty fucking close, I think. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I have no idea what could have happened. Could, I don't know what yeah. people... Um, a group of people can come up with very intense actions once they rally themselves up. So we just got in and took the pictures and got out. But yeah. I had to change on a street corner, so it's like very, everything was very stressful until we were done and could walk away was it worth it yes <laughs> obviously <laughs> fucking awesome shot <laughs> yeah i mean you can't go there and not do it i just yeah uh, once i'm there i had to do it i got as i said i got the bad idea and then i have to pull through i suppose there was nothing illegal about it except maybe before the shirt yeah, I don't know. I catharsis shirt with Jesus uh, it was a blasphemic shirt for yeah. for sure. I mean, it's not like it's the first time any black metal bands ever gone to perform in Israel or or anything, you know. But it's the fact that you made such a powerful opportunity of it, you know. I mean, that picture you can see it going around all over social media now, you know. Rightfully so, I think. You know, I think it, if anything deserves that it's that you know and it's not to be i guess disrespectful towards the the loss and the mourning of those people but it, it kind of like you know it these are the kind of uh events that actually i think it's, it's quite symbolic in a way you know if anything is going to make you believe it's the fact that oh yeah there's this demon appearing here behind the sacred walls where nothing like this has ever appeared before and then moments later that happens yeah, yeah, yeah. you can't make that up no just shows that they have lost they let me into their town <laughs> <laughs> well that's what i was going to say earlier when you're saying people are saying oh go away this guy i was going to say that's not exclusive to israel is it or maybe it is i don't know <laughs> i haven't experienced it before i didn't think so <laughs> no I don't listen to people <laughs> we had no. some problems in greece yeah when, I, when we went to acropolis uh just oh. as we, we had some free time and decided to be tourists and uh I think like it, it was not forbidden to take photos, but uh, they stopped us when we were taking photos of each other and asked us if we were uh, part of a neo-Nazi organization because we have uh, all those runes on our patches, all Icelandic stuff. And I think, you know, it was just like a, a random guard working over there, but they they obviously 
had no idea that these were this was a basic metal guy look and then it it really looked like we were making some uh, propaganda for uh, <laughs> some nazi cult or something i don't know so we just uh, gave this person a speech <laughs> right Right, I gotcha. <laughs> what do you remember? Which bands you were wearing? Mm, we were. Uh, I think it was uh, probably what looked the worst was the Vaunakantur back patch that is like our clan or whatever you want to call it, and it has like a big central picture of uh, the Fenris wolf, which is uh, alternatively called Vaunakantur. And then it has like runes in a circle, or I don't remember. Like, and and also Nadra, the, the our other band has a lot of runes in 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 the in our aesthetics. Uh, nothing to do with any political, uh, yeah, sure, phenomena. But uh, yeah, it's just a part of our culture. You know, it's one of them things. You know. I find it uh, quite interesting. A lot of places when you go to, when people aren't quite as accustomed to, obviously, our thing, you know, with metal and especially the further underground that you go, I think that I, in a way, almost like it when there is that little bit of a clash, when there's that little bit of a tension, you know. I mean, I remember specifically back in, I think I was like 14, 15 years old. Uh, so it's me and one of my closest friends in Tehran. And him and I... We're on the hunt to basically find paint so we can do corpse paint because we've never done it before, you know. And that in itself was like a difficult thing to try and find the material for it. And I remember very specifically going to this uh, little um, little shop, you know, it was like a shop within like a sort of like a smaller shopping center. You know, we've got like lots of those kind of passage kind of places in, in Tehran. And uh, we went to this lady, you know, and she had like a bit of a makeup shop, but you got to consider that obviously it's still within the Islamic confines, you know, and she's still wearing like a proper tent all over her, you know, and everything, you know. So we we went in there and then we were like, oh, sorry, we're looking for some black and white face paint. And she was like, oh, OK, can you show me some examples on your phone? And then I was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I take out my shitty, I think I had like a Sony Ericsson at the time or whatever. And on it was a picture of Maniac from Mayhem in like 2003 when he used to do the corpse paint that was like Zorro where he, he just like had like black mm -hmm. eyes and then the rest of it was white. I showed her the picture and she was like is this satanic? I think you guys need to leave the shop or I'm going to call the police or something. I don't know what the fuck. <laughs> and me and my friend were like, yeah, sorry, bye. You know, like we just we just fucking left, you know, but <laughs> what I'm saying is like I kind of like it because I feel like that is kind of the way I like metal to be perceived. You know, I don't like it when it's always accepted or everyone is like so progressive and like, oh, yeah, you know, it's just the style of music. They're expressing themselves. I like it when there is that tension. Um, yeah, you want your knife to be sharp, right? You don't want like a blunt plastic knife. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think it kind of makes it more interesting. You know, you look throughout the history of the genre, that's always when the good stuff happens. You know, it's when you basically got that sort of tension, that cultural sort of um, uh, sort of uh, shift, you know, that's, uh, and, and friction that, that is like, oh, this is not supposed to be. But then from our end, the metal end, we're like, yeah, but we're going to do it anyway. And yeah. that's kind of what makes it powerful, really. And I'm sure that's the same kind of thing that drove you to probably want to do that photo shoot, despite it probably being a stressful and perhaps even terrifying experience to an extent. Yeah, the, I mean, you need to push the push the limits to get somewhere. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, uh, well, listen, I'm I'm glad that you actually made it back safely. You know, because. Uh, yeah, that uh, that that got pretty scary. I know our friend Christopher; he got stuck behind for like a little. Yeah, uh, the rest of the Rasa guys too got stuck, and yeah, the right. missile went down like fifty meters from our hotel, and but they managed to get out. And in the end, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's you know, like I said, it's fucking crazy. I guess it's worse to be in Palestine than it is to be in Israel, but still. Yeah, for sure. Know. No, it's a shit show. It's yeah. Yeah. Never going to get resolved. Well, at this point, I think it's probably only going to get worse. You know, yeah. it's, it's really hard to see that getting any better, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And of course, Iran's behind it, funding it as well, which is just like... Yeah, I mean, it, it's so much shittery everywhere. So it's no... I don't even want to go down that road. It's too much. <laughs> it, it is too much. I spent... So um, you guys might not have seen this yet, but I've actually just done like about a three and a half hour episode, which will come out just before this one. And that's just about Iran and politics, you know. So for anyone okay. who actually <laughs> wants to explore <laughs> this part of the conversation, you're welcome to go and look at that. Plenty of history, plenty of religion, plenty of politics, everything covered on that one. Um, uh, so, moving on. <laughs> Dagur, since the last time you were on the podcast... You released a fantastic fucking album uh, with uh, Solan Varma, which uh, sort of just took everyone by storm. And this was not long after you released Medhamri, which already was a fucking classic, like an instant classic, basically. So tell us a little bit about that album, you know, because uh, I'm, I'm very intrigued by the whole thing. I know we spoke a little bit about this in person, but just take us through the experience of this one. Your uh, compliments are overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they're true, so get on with it. Yeah, all right. Thank you, guys. Uh, well, I am very proud of uh, both those albums. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Sol and Varma was... Uh, uh, it took way too much time to get it out. Um, we we started working on the project in 2017. And it, it was commissioned for Roadburn Festival, for those who don't know. And uh, the, the organizer behind that festival, Walter, he's a big fan of uh, many of our projects and he's had us over there a few times. And he came to Iceland in 2017 and asked Thomas and me if if we could do something new, because that's the roadburn thing to do something totally different from a regular set. Mm, sure. And, uh, he he asked us like, can I trick you guys to just make a new thing? Like it doesn't have to be called Mister Mink or Nadra or anything. Just can you make just a new thing and do a seventy minute long show? And we were like, are you are you in, insane? Like you you want us to write this much music uh, just for a exclusive commissioned uh, sh show? And he was like, yes. And then he told us a number in in. Uh, you know, a, a money number, and then it all made more sense to us. <laughs> so we were like, okay, well, th then we can actually like look at it as a, a, a serious a project that like is uh, beneficial for everyone. So we're not like throwing a lot of work into just this one thing. And uh, blood, sweat, and tears, all that noise, you know. And then we did the show. Um, it was really stressful because like we wrote the last songs of of that show like maybe three weeks before the show or something and then we were just rehearsing very intensely uh every day and after that uh, we kind of just uh, moved on with our own bands and uh, uh didn't really forget about the solo warmer thing but we like we didn't put it into priority but we were like very certain that we needed to record it and took us like two years to 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 get the whole thing finished with some breaks obviously <clears throat> and then we had the covid and and all that noise which uh, uh made the whole thing uh, delayed much more so like it should have been out i don't know three years earlier or something but but it came now, and I'm I'm very happy about it, and happy to uh, be able to present it to everyone who couldn't make it to the show. And for us, it's a uh, also nice. It's a nice way to say goodbye to that project because we don't have any more intentions to uh, elaborate on that. It's just a one one off thing. That's great. I mean, I think. First of all, how long did you even have to compose that? Because we have to acknowledge it's fairly intricate stuff, you know. I mean, compared to a lot of things that you would do normally, you know, and it's not to say that Miss Therming isn't intricate, but there's a more there is a more straightforward nature to it, you know, where I almost feel like you as a songwriter, which I know you're very capable with this, is that sometimes I feel like you might even strip 
down your skills just so you can make something more just just to suit the art basically and make something more enjoyable to perform live as well you know because there is that sort of dynamic as a songwriter and performer that you get so how long did you actually have to write the soul on varma stuff because it's fairly technical i would say nine months nine months okay uh, it was like uh, we were asked to do it in the summer of 2017 and the show was at roadburn 2018 which is in april or something and um uh, we 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 did have like a little bit of an archive of songs that were not uh, fit for Mr. Ming, not fit for Nara. Uh, so I think we already had like half of the music already there, just songs that weren't, uh, how do you say it, like accounted for. And... Uh, so we we didn't really stress about it we were like okay well we were thinking about making like a compilation album or something like with just random songs with uh mixed lineups in each songs like different drummers and different guitarists and all that so so this was kind of like okay we can make this soul and varma thing become what that old idea was so we only had to write like uh, I don't know, 40 minutes of music instead of the whole 70 minutes. But then again, we, we also had to have some sort of uh, consistency in the whole thing. So there was a lot of work put into making the flow from start to end uh, make sense, have a built up, make it a bit dynamic and all that. So that's all very thought out. And I think like you you shouldn't really listen to just one song or two songs uh, at a time i would rather you just skip it if if you don't have time you just take take those 70 minutes to to go on this journey because that's a, a it's another part of the creative process i think it's how you arrange um the order of songs on your album and also in your set list and all that you, you guys know that already but yeah, it's uh, maybe sometimes we forget about these details that um, we don't have dynamics. If you're like going full blast beat for 20 minutes, then it's not going to be very impressive on minute number 17 and 18, like if it's ongoing. So, yeah, it, it's uh, all carefully thought out. Absolutely. I mean, it's all about the full package, isn't it? You know, it's not like I think I think you put it down very well. It is a very dynamic record. And I particularly experienced this because I, uh, you know, the way I take an album for a spin is always in the gym. You know, I know that now it's then good to listen to it just in a dark room with a candle and vinyl or listen to it whilst you're on the train thinking about, you know, the uh, the futility of life. But my first place to listen to it is in the gym. And I remember just, you know, because the way it flows and goes through all these different dynamics, the way it builds up, there are certain moments. And I think like they're fucking spot on, you know, where, where the album kicks in and then you're just like in it with the moment and you feel like your blood pressure going up, just like, fuck yeah, you know, like you feel that power kicking in. And I think that was actually conveyed very well in this record. Um, would you do anything like that ever again? Like under such pressure, you know, because it, it seemed to me almost like having that pressure and having that deadline almost added to basically what, what it became. Hmm. Well, first of all, thank you. Uh, um, well, before we did Sol on Varma, we were doing these uh, wolf's mass things that uh, were like a, a like a ritualistic events where we were uh, we we put together four bands, three black metal bands and one dark ambient band. Uh, all of which were sharing members and we we put on a show that was like almost uh, 90 minutes or something where all the bands were doing sets but uh, there was uh, never a, a, a silent moment like the dark ambient band was filling in and somebody was maybe doing guest vocals with one band and then uh, three guys out of uh, another band do some uh, choirs uh, in the background of another band and mm this this thing was uh, very exciting and and uh, gained a lot of attention and it came to a point where it was getting more attention than the actual bands and that i found 
incredibly annoying <laughs> because uh, I was more of like a, a showcase and uh, some, uh, I don't know, uh, theatrical bullshit based around the bands. And then people seem to forget about the bands and only look at this uh, ritual thing. And we were getting asked if we could do do this uh, these wolf smashes at various festivals and all that. And I always just asked, why don't you just book Mr. Mink or Nar and we will just mm-hmm. give you equally interesting uh, shows. Uh, so I I quit that thing and told the guys I don't want to do that again. And then later, this Sol and Varma thing came up, and we were like, okay, well, that's something fresh. So to answer your question, I think if we will do something in the future, it needs to have a uh, new foundation and uh, new ideas. O- otherwise, like, you know, we don't want to be repeating something mm-hmm. that's already been perfected and uh, over with. Yeah, I think that, that makes perfect sense, man. And, you know, just as a... Uh my impression with that as well that you're saying well why aren't you guys just booking uh, Miss Thurming for example I think one interesting thing with that is that you're saying that people were paying more attention to the ambient or the theatrical stuff you have yeah, to gimmicks. keep in the gimmicks. gimmicks well I think a part of this if you want to really dissect the human psychology is that a lot of times you got to consider the fact that a lot of people who go to a show and watch a gig they're not necessarily going to understand the musical aspect of it, you know, because it's one of them things. When you become a musician, the more you understand what it takes to perform a certain song, and then if you actually record an album, then you'll hear music even differently from there. You know, there's all these different dynamics to it. And to a lot of people, they can just consume and enjoy what they can understand. And obviously, with this whole... With with our genre in particular, with it being such a niche and such a... Uh, mysterious thing in in many ways i think that uh, a lot of people tend to get lost in the intricacies of the music and i feel like most i mean let's make a ex- very obvious example here do you think that most people who listen to death spell omega actually understand what they're listening to <laughs> that's interesting <laughs> well the first time i heard death spell omega i thought well i need to understand this so i just uh put it on repeat until I understood it. It took, <laughs> took me some time. I, I don't my brain is not that fast. <laughs> there you go. I feel, I feel old sometimes when I listen to this promega. <laughs> 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 that's exactly uh, that's uh, that, uh, nicely done. No, but that's exactly what I mean. You know, it's that you know this is music that it takes time to digest it. You know, and you know to especially see something live for the first time. You know, if you're just looking at the guitarist's hands, it's like oh, it's all moving fast. That, that's not going to make too much sense unless you're a musician yourself or unless you're already familiar with the songs. You know, so I can kind of see why people would gravitate towards something like that. But like you said, obviously there's more to what we all do as well, and. Obviously, since we're speaking of new releases here as well, uh, Bjorn, you finally released the debut album for Ritual Death since the last time you were on here. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. It wasn't out. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Uh, Yeah. How does it feel? Feels really good. Uh, I'm always surprised how dark that uh, project is turning out for each recording. So... Mm. I worked hard on that album. I'm very proud of it. And uh, yeah, also had some visions regarding pictures for that too, that we managed to pull through. So Regarding pictures? Yeah, the picture in the gatefold. I'm standing downtown with a little girl holding her and I have an old guy begging, begging on the side of me. I did that downtown with a mask and everything. So with people walking around. In Trondheim? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that that was that was pretty fucking cool, man. You know, you seem to always be involved in these uh, public black metal uh, stints. Now, the more <laughs> that I think about it, <laughs> yeah, and no, it it was a it was a great great release. And I saw all the ones of like you you got the different shots as the girl is getting closer to yeah. you, whilst you've got the thing, and it, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that the darkness and, and and the whole vibe that you always had in Ritual Death, I feel like 
you managed to translate that and encapsulate it fairly well in this one you know obviously you had all the smaller releases prior to this but this one i do really feel like whatever it is that ritual death is god that that vibe and the energy it got translated extremely well obviously i was lucky enough to actually watch you rehearse this material before you even recorded it that was pretty fucking cool yeah um which was what like a year ago now maybe two years ago i can't remember how long ago it was two two years ago maybe i don't remember yeah actually i'm good with dates so i should remember hang on february 2022 that's when it was so, yeah, I, have uh, no idea. I don't know what day it is today even so <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it, it's you know it's irrelevant you know once once this podcast is out it's eternal you know so that's that's really uh <laughs> that's that's what matters you know yeah. um but yeah no i feel i feel like you did a great job of this you know and and you know um i mean it's great to to sort of see that uh, but i mean what are sort of the plans with that going forward because i know at the moment you're extremely busy with darvaza as well. Yeah, um, that's the problem. I'm busy traveling a lot, but we have already started new material. So yeah, we're working. Yeah, just when we have time, we're gonna start rehearsing again and try out new stuff. And then, uh, there's some plans for a split release with someone. Uh, yeah, but yeah, let's see. Just have to have, get the time to work on the new ideas. That's great, man. So you're actually we'll planning on doing up too. Okay, with ritual death. Yeah. Playing with the Avel in Oslo in three weeks or something. Great stuff, great stuff. And and I understand that on this album, part of that uh, was also inspired by one of your favorite bands called Merc. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, very. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it kind of helped me write Black Metal Terror in a way. So, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, Let's not go down that road. Just unnecessary band that don't need any mentions. Oh, okay, cool. I didn't know anything about that. I just wanted to ask because I, I know that you you said that that you 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 like them. That that's that's the only reason why I mentioned it. Yeah, I like them a lot. <laughs> like okay. Then. No, no. I think it's a very un unnecessary band, uh, which pretty much is everything that's wrong with black metal nowadays. Okay, can you be more specific about that? I'm curious now. Well, it's that, uh, like a plastic knife we're talking about. And there's no, I feel he's, uh, it, those bands are mostly like riding on old legends uh, glory in a way. Hmm. And then, then they want to take away everything that is dangerous with the genre. Want to make it safe. Sure, I got you. And, and by the way, I'm not uh, specifically uh, talking about them. I'm purely just stirring the pot here because I think it's mm. funny. But generally speaking, uh, you know, like, what is it you think that is missing for a lot of these bands? You know, because you said you just said that they're basically like riding the coattails of the legends of the genre and then losing the power of it. it specifically, what is it that you think is, hypothetically speaking, sets apart let's say i don't know ritual death darvaza or misterming from let's say other bands uh not specifically but like other bands that you feel don't quite have the it which you're talking about it's, it's like missing a certain darkness a dangerous darkness like that's called out from the depths hmm. and yeah it's that that thing you can't describe that just they're riding the safe wave and doing you know following all the what should you say all the rules in the industry in a way but they have i don't feel that they have bled for it and uh, like they they can walk on that side of the street don't cross the street to our side because we have gone through other shit we've gone through shit to end up here so that's cost cost a lot for some people so yeah, it's that there's just the thing you can't describe that darkness that certain music has, which they don't have. It's it's flat, it's empty, it's it's a Viking helmet to, with plastic horns. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. I mean, I have to say, like, I do agree with you. Now, whether I want to be pointing fingers personally saying oh that band's got it that band hasn't got it that's kind of like i think it loses the point but i do agree with you completely that um, 
I think there's a certain thing that makes black metal in particular, there's a, there's a special edge to it that makes it what it is. Um, but I think it's a combination of a lot of things, you know, and at the core of it, I guess, being, I suppose, a willingness to dissect your own psyche and, and see how far you can go and, and see what yeah. kind of places you can go to. How, how much do you think that's relatable to what you're saying? Yeah, no, no, that sounds very correct. You have to break yourself down in order to build yourself up again, right? So it's all about that, to travel down in the abyss, so to speak, and find the coal that you can shine up to be a di diamond. Hmm. And what happens down there uh, while you're looking for that, that can be a lot of challenging things. I can completely appreciate that. And I guess that's quite appropriate considering the background of which that you're speaking from as well you know obviously with uh, celestial bloodshed i guess that speaks volume of of what you guys did in that band but then also later even in one tail one hand or pretty much any of your other projects you know i think that you are speaking from a place of experience obviously mm -hmm. so i guess that 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 is quite valid huh mm -hmm. got the scars to prove it sure sure I, I appreciate that Dogger how, how do you relate to that aspect or that approach to, to music in general <laughs> well I got in some trouble for talking about this in an interview one time <laughs> uh, All right. I, I, I think it has something to do like um, um, it's like why do you think it's annoying to see an Iron Maiden t-shirt in an H&M store and see persons like uh, Kim Kardashian or her uh, family members wearing those shirts like uh, it's annoying for you because you know that they don't like seven song of a seven song and they have never heard raining blood and you know they like like why are they uh touching on it it's like we could call this cultural appropriation or whatever because it's i think it's annoying for us because um we as metalheads we've been fucking diving deep into this music since we were children and it's it's it is sort of like religion to us and seeing someone just casually th throwing uh throwing on a, a maiden shirt or uh, talking about black metal like it's a um, very interesting uh, subculture or something like that like mm. that really it's it's really annoying because that's totally not uh, how we perceive it in in our world and uh, then then it's like uh, when it comes to other musicians that seem to be not on the same wavelength as you like there's a lot of uh, music out there that's labeled black metal but doesn't qualify at all as black metal in my humble opinion which is not even that humble but you know <laughs> I, I i would just say that uh, um when when somebody like us like i would say that we know black metal what it means and and uh, what it stands for like if we don't resonate with some uh, new band that's uh, everybody's talking about like oh, it's a very interesting new black metal band that has uh, very uh, eco-friendly lyrics and uh, blah 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 and you, if you just don't resonate with it you, you can you can just feel it as as the music starts you're like no it's a soft plastic knife it doesn't it doesn't cut it and I, I can't put it much more into words. It's just like, if you know, you know. Yeah. If I have to explain it to you, you will never understand. Yeah. 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 I, I feel that, you know, and uh, again, I think this is why it was so fucking cool that, you know, without blowing our own trumpets, you know, that we were all sharing the stage in London. I feel like that event was like a perfect example of that, you know, where it's like, boom, 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 you know, like back to back. 
you get the i guess the authentic experience of of that feeling you know like you say like dogger when you were just saying about like what is what classes as, as black metal and whatnot like to me i would probably consider danzig to be more black metal than a lot of probably contemporary like extreme metal artists that are trying to go under that same sort of category you know i think it's it's more what's unique about black metal is that as far as the sound is concerned is probably the most diverse subgenre of all time but then equally what makes it what it is is this distinct um intent i suppose that goes behind the music does that make sense yeah yeah, um, and, you know, maybe it goes far beyond just uh, the black metal topic because, you know, all of us like uh, a lot of music that's not black metal, but uh, has I don't know this same uh, same integrity or same drive, like it's something that has got. And I don't know, we are uh, we are uh, just some guys. Like we we we're full of testosterone and we we need some pounding shit to get going. No matter if it's uh, fucking merciful fate or Guns and Roses or Mayhem or Portal or whatever. Like it, as long as it's filthy and uh, like you know on on the tours with Motorhead, nobody was allowed to take a shower. Like that's kind of the the attitude that we are going for. Hmm. Although <laughs> I I wouldn't really like to do a whole tour without taking a shower, but you, you get oh, the point. Yeah, I think didn't one tail one head do that at one point? No, I think Celestial on the first tour. I think the Finnish people said we smell better on stage than off stage. <laughs> Oof, that's, that's a lot. <laughs> the Finnish people said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely well didn't you have that situation where you had a blood fester in in, in the tour bus where you, where you hadn't quite practiced that that art just yet no i mean i didn't give a fuck so i don't think anyone was showered the whole week there and had the same bucket of blood with us the whole whole tour too that's fucking great that's killer Did, didn't you say selim brought you that yeah, yeah, he brought the uh, on the first gig he came with. It. No, was that on the tour? Maybe it was either on the tour. Or I think maybe either was on the tour on the first gig we played in Netherlands. I mean, either way, that's fucking cool as fuck. You know, like that's that's a piece of history. I think, right? Yeah, I gave him my blood when they play in Bergen there on the, beyond the gates, right and I, I drained my own blood and gave it to him. See, that's, I think, see, that's, you know, we're, we're coming back to the same point, you know, that's the, that's the degree of, um, you know, crossing the barriers that, that we're talking about, you know, is it, sort of crossing that threshold within yourself, within your own mind, but also within the bar barriers and, and boundaries of life to go to these places, you know, it's kind of like the way, the way I've always described it on, on here is that I always viewed this music as uh and, and to the point of dogger as well it's not exclusive to black metal at all i'm sure you, you can both see the iron maiden poster in the background but uh to me it's the um yeah yeah it's the balls you know and it's that sort of uh it's it's crossing the boundary crossing the threshold you know like going to places that others wouldn't dare go you know or going to places that no one else has gone but doing it for the sake of art doing it for the sake of finding that thing you know the the coal that like you said you know you can um you can keep shining it until it turns into a diamond i 100 percent feel that man you know and, and i especially relate to this particularly with my background as well and and also then coming into the uk and experiencing the the cold and the solitude of being here away from everyone and then not having any friends for like the first however many years that i was here not knowing a single fucking person and standing at a bus stop in the middle of the fucking night looking at the sky and then everything is pitch black and then there's there's nothing around me and then experiencing that degree of i guess darkness and um 
and uh, an isolation for the first time, you know, but then also rather than be overwhelmed by it, use it as like a, as like a tool, really, yeah. as a creative and artistic. Turn the negative into the tool that you can use for yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I guess we, we all can get inspired by different things, can't we? You know, whether it's life events, whether it's emotions... I think that's that's all it really is, you know. It's like the uh, it's like the triangle. I forget what you call them, you know, but it's like the cover of uh, Pink Floyd's "Dark Side of the Moon," you know, where you shine light on one end and then on the other end comes out a rainbow. I guess that's kind of mm. what it is, you know. The, the line going into it is the life experiences and the emotions that we all experience, and then on the other side, as an artist, we get to basically splash it out into the world. Now, it doesn't always have to be in the format of rainbows. Sometimes it can be in the <laughs> format of, uh, <laughs> of absolute that, to bloodshed. Be, to be correct, now we can say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With the exception of the band Rainbow, which were fucking great, by the way. But yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it i think i think that's kind of what what becomes powerful isn't it i guess uh i don't know how you both relate to this but i guess that's kind of like what drives it really you know that that artistic intent exists as a direct consequence of the simple fact that we're alive and that we experience life in the heightened form that we do yeah, yeah. i'm on the very stubborn and stupid because who would choose this if you actually would have like if you want to be safe and comfortable this is not what you should do <laughs> so we're putting a mark on ourselves like uh, yeah stand out and uh, choose to walk paths which no one has walked before and see where it takes us yeah absolutely i feel that man i feel that and I guess, uh, yeah, and, and, and that could be anything. I mean, Dogger, like for you, for example, like uh, we're talking about these different uh, inspirations and things. I mean, how much of that do you feel like you can get just from your surroundings, especially up in Iceland, which we can agree is probably quite a unique environment? I mean, I'm sure that the same applies to Bjorn as well, but just for yourself, you know, how do you think that environment and that sort of degree of isolation which you've got over there but also the beautifulness of the nature there actually um sort of influences what it is that you're doing yeah dog why are you so angry you live in a beautiful place where's the <laughs> anger coming from you young boy says bjorn <laughs> I'm, I'm old and grumpy come on <laughs> well i i think i think that uh like every time uh someone is uh creating something like artistic or not like uh, i think we are uh, always more inspired than we even uh, realize because uh, even the words we choose to express anything like we we we're we, we not always thinking about why we choose each word and what lies behind each word and and the same goes for when you write a melody like why do you want to play that melody fast uh, what 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 sort of mood are you trying to create uh, i'm not sure how to how to say this more clearly I th i'm just saying that uh, sometimes you are very clear about uh, your inspirations and uh, this uh, single light that's going into the triangle but uh, Sometimes there's uh, so much more happening without you even knowing, and uh, a lot of it can be like underlying anger or rage or uh, sadness or stuff like that. That like even maybe you don't even maybe you can't even put put your finger on it. Maybe you need to go to a therapist and dig really deep for many weeks before you even realize where it all comes from. So uh, it's. Uh, I, I think that it's a, it's a much much uh, bigger picture than than we do always uh, realize. Yeah, because sometimes also it's like uh, you don't understand what you created until it's ready, and then you hear it and listen to the oh, that's what I meant. That's how. Yeah, I felt exactly, back then. exactly. Like uh, songs from ten years ago make more sense now than it did when you actually made them. So. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that. Yeah. I always write my lyrics after I write the songs, and I'm, I'm sort of uh, jealous of uh, other bands that do it uh, the opposite, 
Yeah, same. Uh, because uh, I would uh, I would love to have like a lyric in front of me and just look at it and uh, ask myself like what feeling do I get from this uh, little poem, and then pick up the guitar and be all dramatic about it. Like uh, I don't know, do do the Shakespeare thing on my instrument, and uh, but it never goes like this. I I always write the songs out of. No, where like the melodies don't come from words, but then later on when I listen to the songs, then the words come out because I realize, yeah, that's the mood I was in or the mood I was going for when I wrote these melodies. So that makes it all much easier for me, at least. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think the way, I, I mean, I relate to this as well. I am exactly the same. I always write the song first and then the lyrics but i think a big part of that is because the whole point of music is being able to convey and express emotions which you're unable to do so using words or anything else Uh, exactly like the fact the simple fact that a combination of a certain notes makes you feel a certain way i mean what the fuck is even going on there you know like this is a very very powerful thing which i think that this far into the human existence which we still don't fully understand what's happening when music is playing you know or like uh, it's magic it is magic it, that's it is i magic. think the Basic easiest magic. way to des- describe it yeah and then yeah, again I, it takes me back to the, my point about the resonance because uh everybody has different tastes in music and uh you you resonate with the music that you like and what's the reason for that is it because uh there's uh, some uh, band makes dark music and uh you 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 totally feel like yes i understand why they are creating this mood or uh or maybe you think like oh this is uh answering some questions for myself or something like that it can also be for happy music or happy art or whatever even fucking um uh, uh, funny movies like <laughs> like a- a- anything uh that you can relate to is uh is basically why uh, i think that's what s- separates good art from bad art which is of course uh, um uh, subjective mm-hmm. uh thing but you get where I'm going with this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. Absolutely. I think um, I think it's absolutely fascinating. But, you know, just going back to your point from earlier as well, I, I find this quite thought-provoking when you were saying that you sometimes have emotions and things which you don't even really know where that's coming from, you know? I mean, there's so much to just that idea alone, you know, in that who knows, you know, because if you even think of the human existence... This is the way I always try and observe humans and just our experience in general. Because we sometimes forget that this reality exists, you know, and it, you know, it takes a degree of thinking to even come to that conclusion. But the simple fact that you are alive, that the three of us here are, are sad, we're alive, we're breathing. And the fact that anyone else is listening to this out there, you know, uh, beyond the fourth wall, there's this thing that we always have to consider and it's the fact that you've never experienced death at the very least in the physical sense why because if you had done your genes wouldn't have been passed on this far so as long as life has existed so have you and that the fact that we are here at this moment is a result of the fact that this gene has constantly survived and been passed along and perhaps our ancestors, you know, and for some, maybe even parents might have passed away, but at least we are here. So we've survived through all of that. We've survived through everything. So if you want to then look at it that way, then you can also say that we are carrying the emotions and the experiences of all of our ancestors and everyone who came before us with us at this moment in time. You know, like there's that saying that... You know, like if you want to raise your children, you're doing so by the way that you behave and and you live your life prior to conceiving them, you know, 
and uh and i think that's very true you know that's why like some of us we have very common fears and things you know that's why some people they can't go in the shower for too long because if they close their eyes they think they're gonna get attacked you know a lot of these things i think are inspired by certain events and things which have happened throughout history now you can think that it's not even been that long since we've had electricity you know so prior to this so much of all of our dna contains experiences of isolation or, uh, or especially for you guys sailing overseas you know and then farming and you know and and trying to survive in the cold when they were tormented by nature and i think a lot of times we 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 spend perhaps too much time just looking at what's in front of us on social media or whatever but how much of these emotions that we are trying to convey perhaps aren't even our own personally but rather from all of those who came before us that's very deep for my hangover <laughs> <laughs> it it just reminds me of an experiment i heard of where the they were uh... Or maybe it was just accidental. Like they, they were, there was like a chicken farm where uh, they were flying some drones over, over the chickens, and the chickens didn't care. But then an eagle flew over as well, and then all the chicken freaked out. We're like, okay, so they're not afraid of just an entity that's flying over them, but. Like and they, they these were like farm chickens, so they had never seen an eagle before, and that's the thing. Like they they still knew the difference, and they knew they should be afraid of the of the eagle, but not the drones or whatever machine it was that was flying over. So yeah, of course, some of it is built into the DNA, but uh, I think we, we most most of what we. Uh, uh i don't know man this is also too deep for me <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to challenge uh, not, you, not but... all of it comes from uh, dna that's uh like I, I think a good part of it especially fear and uh survival instincts are definitely from there <laughs> yeah for sure well to your point as well you know one of the main reasons why so many deers get run over by cars is because they can recognize what a car is they don't know what it is it's not in their ev evolutionary thing i perhaps in some areas they might have discovered this you know and over time they realize oh yeah if we go in front of this thing you fucking die but uh you know a, a lot of them they don't recognize the smell they don't rec recognize the lights and that's why they constantly they they get brain freeze you know uh, i'm sure i i don't know if you might have experienced this but we actually had this happen um just last year when we were shooting the music video for Azrael, we went down to uh, Suffolk in England to do the band shots. And just as we were driving through these little roads, there were lots of deer running in front of the car. But they would get in front of the car and they'd fucking stall. And they just wouldn't move, even though we could have easily like run them over. Obviously, we stopped the car and we didn't do that. But um, that's part of what it is. They don't recognize it. So you're, what you're saying about that experiment with the chickens as well is completely accurate. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there we Which go. reminds me, Bjorn, my mom says hi. No, say hey back. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to come over and eat the food. Oh, yes. You, you shall. And soon, I hope. You haven't yeah. been to Iceland for what? No, Six you guys don't like my bands. You never book us. Yeah, well, no, nobody's booking a lot of foreign bands here. No. We have a death fest. You you already played there. Yeah. Yeah, it was five years ago. <laughs> Can I just jump in Time here? Flash. So, I, obviously, you two have had a lot of uh, cooperation together over time, and you've actually got a tour coming up. But how did you two actually originally meet? Tour. Yeah. I think it was tour. Yeah. It was mm. one tentor when you were sitting between me and Eugen. No, no, I have a picture of us. <laughs> uh oh. Funny, funny picture of us from Beyond the Gates, same year. Okay. And, and like the first Mystic show ever was in uh, in Oslo at Inferno 2015. And then later that same year, there was the Beyond the Gates. And that's when we met 
at, at I think it was at least there, maybe at Inferno, when I broke Tilton's knee. Oh no, I, I don't think I met you. Uh, oh, when okay. You <laughs> <laughs> Who's yeah. knee did you break? Uh, Tilton. Uh, one tail, one head. <laughs> All right. He All knocked right. him down. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Shit happens, huh? Yeah, well, it, it was all uh, resolved very nicely. <laughs> yeah, That's but cool. uh, yeah, the first time we toured together was in 2015 uh, after Nitrosa and Blackmas mm. in Brussels. It was December 2015. Then uh, Doggy was sitting between me and Avin, the drummer, and we forced him to drink whiskey whenever we drank whiskey. So he grew up on that tour. Yeah. I learned I how to behave like a rock star. <laughs> and they made me listen to Guns N' Roses the whole tour. You you make it sound like <laughs> as if as if it was a terrible thing to happen. For a whole tour, you know. <laughs> it was only six days, but it felt like a whole tour. <laughs> I just slept, woke up, gave him whiskey, went back to sleep. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know that Bjorn's official role for Miss Therming is basically around the subject of hydration. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I'm making sure they're never thirsty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you taught me so many bad habits, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Trying to sleep on that uh, terrible small van. Everybody's oh. cramped and uh, it smells like shit and... You, <laughs> barely catch maybe one hour of a very loose sleep and then Bjorn hits you with his elbow like hey dude wake up you gotta have a sip <laughs> passes me a Jameson or a Jim Bean bottle like and it's warm there's nothing to mix it and I'm just 22 years old <laughs> uh. no but it was really fun really really fun yeah, we have always had good tours. Uh, work very, very good as a team too. Like everyone is helping out, and uh, best guys to tour with. Absolutely, we always have this great symbiosis. We work together. So, mm. yeah, and people seem to like our bands uh, a lot because we are always at the same festivals. Yeah, which is very convenient for us. We have an excuse sure. to to meet and behave like idiots. Uh, yeah. Uh, Many, many times. I don't think you were too badly behaved in London. Or were you? No, I wasn't. I never behaved bad. Dog is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pass the blame on to Dogger. I never blame bad. <laughs> no, but Long London was fucking cool, man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was killer. That was killer. That, that hang that we all had at that fucking random travel lodge bar. After yeah. the show, that was fucking great. I really enjoyed that. Even though I wasn't drinking, and one of you guys actually... I don't know whose idea it was to give me a shot of water, because I don't drink. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. I thought yeah. so. <laughs> I mean, it was nice to be included, I guess. Yeah. 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 See, Bjorn, Bjorn never got to try any, any of the stuff you just explained when, when we did the tour together before. Because uh, he 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 knew he he knew that 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 I needed to be uh, I needed to be in the right mind to basically make sure that uh, the operations went when I had to plan. That was a fucking great experience, by the way. I realized that when you were when on the was podcast. That? So this was June last year. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I I, I yeah, realized uh, that Shion shaved uh, saved the whole tour like fixing everything. Shaved right. the whole and tour. Shaved the whole. <laughs> went around and shaved everyone. Yeah, I did that too, but I also saved it. Yeah. <laughs> so he fixed everything in a week or something. Just everything fell apart, and then he built it up again. And Beyond Man and Trivax uh, travel around England. Mm -hmm. Had a great tour, actually. Good fucking times, man. Yeah. That was that was great, and and it also extremely stressful prior to it, but it was worth it. I wasn't gonna let that fall apart, you know. Um, yeah. I I realized as as we were talking about this that last time Bjorn came on the podcast for anyone else who's listened to that that was before we did the tour, and obviously a lot of stuff happened prior to the tour itself. But without going into any details, basically we found out like two three weeks out that. Two of the shows, well, one of the shows got canceled. One of the shows, the venue that we'd been promoting and selling tickets for this whole time had never received confirmation. Uh, 
we didn't have any accommodation booked for the whole thing and we didn't have any transport and that weekend was the we weekend of uh, it was like a bank holiday from both ways you know so it was some celebration of the queen so it was near impossible but somehow basically pulling every string that i had using all my connections in the uk and whatever and with a lot of help also from the other trivex guys we managed to basically build this tour back from scratch you know like in in like two three weeks you know and and also it helped bjorn sending some long uh, essays to our uh to the pro to our good promoters in london who actually ended up doing a fantastic job but uh, they were under the impression it was going to get cancelled and we were like nope fuck no we're not cancelling we changed the name of the tour to acta non verba as a as a bit of a symbolic kind of transformation and then and then we did it and it was like honestly one of the best times in trivex's history uh, so far as far as i'm concerned like it was fucking fantastic you know all of the turnouts were great but also how cool it was to share the stage with you guys and also go through all the antics as well <laughs> yeah it was great yeah yeah there's a lot of videos from that <laughs> tour <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah there, there's a dog i think you'll, you'll appreciate this but there's one in particular where i think it's me bjorn and uh and oivin he, he, he yeah. was there with us as well and we're all doing some Islamic prayers outside this venue in Bristol. It's, it's fucking <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Loud in the street. Yeah, yeah. Bjorn actually <laughs> fully got on his knees and he's doing the Allah, Allah, like that. It's fucking perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously with me and Solly being Middle Eastern, like we, the whole package, the whole tour package gets away with that humor. So it's perfect. That's the only reason I brought you. <laughs> <laughs> no man that was great times I, I hope you get the chance to do that again um uh, so you guys have the tour coming up uh what is it next month with the uh, miss therming and darvaza yes yeah. okay um, Halloween and drunk starts november 29th i think yeah yeah in Very poland cool. yeah and then it's like uh seven shows in germany yeah, something uh, like that. And uh, yeah, we're gonna end in uh, an uh, Eindhoven metal meeting, and then the Mortem at Diabolum in Berlin. Berlin. Yeah. Oh, great, great. Yeah, those are the, we're actually doing one of those guys' events in uh, April. Actually, uh, would have been great if we were doing the one in December. You know, just to get the excuse to play. We're talking about again. Walpurgis Nacht. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're doing that with Trivex in yeah. April, April cool. twenty six, I think. Yeah, yeah. We were Something there last like time. Also, very good. Yeah, yeah. That's cool, man. That's cool. Well, so are you guys looking forward to this tour? Then I got I got to be honest with you. You know, like without sounding bitter, I I'm kind of like you know, uh, kind of jealous that that we're not actually joining <laughs> both of you on on this tour. That would have been really sound bitter. Fun. I am bitter. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm admitting to it. <laughs> yeah, no, can... I'm looking very much forward to it. We, yeah. we can we can do a, a tour later. I know that, sure that uh, I, I need another excuse to plan a tour with Bjorn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no control of this. I just lean back and Dogger calls me and tells me where I need to be. Yeah. There you go. There you go. That, that dynamic rings a bell. Um, have, yeah. Have you never toured without me? I haven't gone any tour without me. <laughs> pretty much like uh, uh like a van or nightliner tours never okay <laughs> we 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 did the tour in 2021 like there was like an open window during covid times when we we did it with uh, daniel kiltown yeah. so it was like a mini scandinavian tour with the mr mink and nara did oslo stockholm malmö our okay. house and Copenhagen, and uh, I caught COVID during the tour, probably at the first gig. And it was yeah, already important get... to stay positive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Fuck off. laughs> yeah, we we carried on yeah. and uh, spread the plague <laughs> throughout <laughs> Scandinavia, unknowingly, of course. Until the last day when I was uh, like getting really fucking sick and almost didn't make it home because oh. uh, 
uh, the regulations were that way that uh, you didn't need to take a test before going into the plane to get home. You would just have to take a test upon arrival. So we were like, okay, worst case scenario, if we have COVID, like we can at least go home and mm-hmm. then go to quarantine at home. But then when we showed up at the airport in Copenhagen, uh, we were going to the check-in and they asked us, yeah, do you have the test? And we were like, no, we don't need to have any test. Well, it's a disclaimer for the airline. So uh, please go to that uh, booth over there and take a test. <laughs> we, you got to pay for it as well, right? Yeah, yeah, but uh, it was not that expensive, maybe 20 euros or something. But, right. Uh, it was before they discovered how lucrative it was, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So so we so we went and got all of us tested, both Nara and Mr. Mink, and uh, three of us were tested positive, and the rest of the guys, they were just like, well, we are going to go home Uh this is kind of your problem. We were like, yes, it is totally our problem. You guys should definitely take your flight home. So they left us there and we we had no idea what we were going to do. And we didn't want to be inside the airport because we're like, okay, fuck. Now that we have like a confirmation that we are, do have COVID, we don't want to be like inside the airport surrounded by people. And all that. So we were standing out there in the middle of November in outside the airport which is like an hour away from the city and we we all we had was one phone number so we called that phone number and it was some sort of office where they were like yeah well uh are you in copenhagen we we're like no uh we are we are at the airport ah okay so you'll have to call someone uh, in this number we get another number and and they ask us, okay, so you did the rapid test. Yes. Uh, do you have like the PCR test or was it called that? Yeah, yeah, yeah PCR, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and we were like, well, we don't have the PCR. Okay, so you have to go to this office uh, down by the airport where you will take the PCR. So we did that and they gave us another phone number, which was like a hotel for people with covid and we called that number and they told us, yeah, well, you can come here, but we don't have any food. And we were like, well, we are probably going to have to be in quarantine for like two weeks. How are we going to get food? Yeah, well, you're not going to get food here, but here is a phone number. So we, we went to, I think we went through like 12 different phone numbers until we made it a full circle where we got the first phone number again. <laughs> and we decided to just say, fuck it, man. And we looked at the next flights and there was a different airline flying to Iceland just a few hours later that had uh, a different disclaimer regarding those tests. So we just bought those tickets and got the fuck out of there. (laughs) Good. (laughs) We'd have been fucking bankrupt otherwise. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Jeez. fuck that. that. That's 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 completely fucked. You know, like that. Did you say that? You said that was twenty twenty one. Was that twenty twenty one or twenty twenty? The end Cause... end of twenty twenty one. End of twenty twenty one. Right. Yeah. No. So they were that. like I... getting loose on the regulation, so we were able to plan the gigs and do the tour, but uh, everything regarding travel was still pretty serious. Right, gotcha. Yeah, th- that reminds me because maybe just a few months after that, when I was visiting Norway, because this is kind of funny, because I actually gave Bjorn COVID as well. You know, like I uh, back in. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You're welcome. He was saying like I should have stayed extra, but what happened was I never got any of the COVID vaccines. You know, I still haven't. But because of that, at that time, you were still required to show tests to basically go through the airport. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was like that both for UK and Norway. And what happened was, whilst I was in Norway, I'm like, you know, I, I mean, I felt absolutely fine. I felt great, actually. But uh, I went to Trondheim, and then I came back down to Oslo, and then I was meeting people there. And then just as I'm about to, like, I had my f- flight one day, and then the day before that, I thought, okay, I'll go and do one of these tests then, so I can, like, show it at the airport because I've not got the vaccination passport, whatever. And then I go do it, do the test and it comes out positive. I'm like, oh, fuck. You know, like <laughs> I said to the woman, I said, you are kidding me, right? Like you are joking. And she was like, no, here it is here. Positive. I'm like, oh, cool. I didn't even know. So um, 
yeah basically i had a situation where i ended up having to stay there for like an additional like four or five days i just grabbed like the i exchanged my ticket to the first one i could find and then i just had to hope that the my body would have defeated the virus and then like four days later i was i did a test at the airport in um uh, garden morn airport mm. Uh, mm. you know the like they ended up doing it for like 60 fucking euros i'm like if this comes back positive i'm gonna fucking kick off here and then it came back negative i was like all right then so then i just got on the plane and fucked off back to uk but i can't feel i i relate to you know like when you're explaining your situation with that and how stressful that must have been like i could feel that completely you know especially when it's not just yourself but you got the responsibility of the whole band that's a pretty shitty fucking thing to go through and hopefully we never have to experience anything dumb like that ever again no. No, it's, it's weird to be in a different country and see all your plans of getting home just shattered that's yeah. fucking it's a weird thing hmm. yeah which uh, made me uh, think i'm uh, very happy we're not living in war times or at least not our our uh, homes yeah that is true i guess iceland would be a fairly safe country to be in right Mm, even if yeah it probably it, it's like it's a good uh good location for like uh, uh military operations when traveling between europe and america so like mm. during the second world war we were occupied by the u.s army and some brits as well i think mostly the u.s army so like they were like claiming this area in case it's like a, it's a good base so there, there was there were no battles here during the second world war but uh we were occupied. yeah the military presence yeah, yeah 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 i gotcha yeah it's funny me and my girlfriend were recently talking about this you know about like what would be a good place well i was talking about it and she was just listening <laughs> but that happens a lot in that relationship doesn't it <laughs> uh, you would know <laughs> <laughs> no but <laughs> i was talking about it because i'm always the doomsday person you know and i was like uh, oh you know so what would be like a good place you know to go to in case like there is an explosion or or like a nuclear fallout or anything like that because it can happen like that you know it would it wouldn't take very very long for it to happen you know like you wouldn't really get much of a warning i, I don't think um you know, especially with all these new types of rockets and things like that, that especially like Russia's got at the moment, you know, and I, I was thinking, you know, like, you know, one of the best places you can probably go to is, I would have thought maybe, um, I don't know, just, I guess, places where it's a little bit more secluded. There's not a lot of people that go there, but then perhaps... Svalbard. Where is that? <laughs> Bjorn, where is Svalbard? Where it is? So it's uh, <laughs> Norway, but it's just uh, cold snow, and it's like Iceland. Yeah, it's it's outside right of on. Norway, right? Like yeah. north of. Yeah, it's, I I heard it's a, a pretty uh, cold place, <laughs> to say the least. Is that where it borders oh, with Finland? Uh, I'm not sure. Me and the maps, I'm terrible. terrible. No, but it's work. like I I think it's snowy uh, all year long and yeah, yeah, po yeah. polar bears. It's close to Russia, I think. Yeah. All the kids uh, are taught how to use a uh, rifle in case of a they, bear. They have uh, bears like walking in the street. They have an alarm that shit. We have a bear in the town. You need <laughs> and by to, uh, that, go inside. You're... And and by that you're not referring to a gay person. You mean an actual bear, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A polar okay. bear. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. No, I, I guess that would. That's be a, a good place to go if there's war. Sure. I'm going sure. to the Swedish forests with the uh, running water and the uh, shelf. Yeah. 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 Well. Well. I think out of all of us, Bjorn, you're probably the one who's the most experienced at self-sustaining, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we're going to set up, I have a cabin in Sweden, we're going to set up so we can do some plantation there and we can fish and we have yeah, by running water. This is pretty much in the middle of nothing, so that's, that's a good place to be. And you got a gym built there as well, specifically for me, right? Yeah, only for you. 
<laughs> no, that's cool, man. I'd love to visit that place. Yeah. Where in Sweden did you say? Uh, Hede. So it's like four or five hours drive from here. Right on. Pretty right much on. just straight across the border. That's fucking cool. I think that just goes hand in hand, you know, with with like the with the metal lifestyle, especially black metal, because it's kind of like it's all about like carving your own path and then just like kind of directing things in your own way, you know. And that's like, I guess, the perfect epitome of of doing that. I guess, right? Yeah. No. Try try to not be so addicted to the society. Just try to stand on your own legs. Mm. own feet maybe yeah yeah and it's not easy no absolutely not it's uh, harder work the easiest thing is to just get a job and let everyone else take care of you you trade your you trade your uh, freedom for safety i can understand when people do that but not for me mm. yeah and that's something that takes so many years to figure it out you know because yeah. we, we've spent you know, like speaking of just like the ancestral bloodline and the experience of those people who came before us, they spent such a long time perfecting these skills and things, which take a lot of time. You know, farming is not just something that anyone can do. It's an extremely stressful thing. And especially now that they're trying to clamp down on it, these cunts that are basically trying to take away all the land and make it unsustainable for farmers, you know, and you, I'm sure you've all seen what's happening in uh, Netherlands at the moment, which is a totally cunty fucking thing that the government's been doing but i think that uh, you don't realize how difficult it is to be self-sustaining you know we all just have this like very dreamy idea of a, oh a cabin in the woods and then you think it's like oh yeah and then well in that thing you need heating and you need to be able to get food and uh, then uh, and then a part of you eventually is going to need to socialize you know so it's it's very yeah. difficult it's very difficult yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. so what what's the plans then for armageddon uh, make a festival out of it. Okay. Who would you book on your Armageddon festival? I'll book uh, Miss Fumin. Good House choice. Band, like every day. <laughs> okay. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> if I can stay in your cabin. Yes, you can. You, you have a problem. you have a jacuzzi, I hope. No, but we have a sauna. Okay. Good start. Um, we're gonna so, practice that we, on the tour too. Be sauna kings. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> right on. The last tour, dog, and they were the smart ones. They went out to spa and sauna, and I was just sitting there. They come fresh and nice. <laughs> That's a good fucking idea. <laughs> yeah, it totally is totally opposite to the motorhead thing, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We we just had this idea because. Um, uh, uh, most of us in Mizrimig are big uh, fans of uh, the, the sauna culture, and the uh, sauna culture is rich in Iceland here, as as it is in Scandinavia. And uh, uh, we just realized that when we're on tour, especially if you're the headliner, you're the first one to do the sound check and the last one to go on stage in the evening. So we had the biggest gap to uh, do something. And we Bjorn, realized... Did you see how he just flexed them? <laughs> <laughs> I let it slide. Yeah. yeah. The yeah, not so, so we, humble. We we got the idea to uh, to just open Google Maps and type in sauna. And in every city we went to, there were like so many options. And we just looked at a few and avoided the gay ones there was a lot of gay ones uh but you didn't but want the competition or mostly <laughs> mostly for that reason <laughs> i like to be left alone when i'm in the sauna <laughs> yeah but uh and yeah then it's just uber like the fucking shit you can do with your telephone today it's ridiculous absolutely yeah. ridiculous and we took advantage of that <laughs> uh, very smart very smart i was just drinking beer yeah, well, we were, of course, drinking beer when we got back from the sauna. So, like, had to level with you in some way. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll take you mind. take you with us to the saunas this tour. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do something different. Pixar, Actually. it didn't happen. Wait, that came... Wait, wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> Keep your fantasies for yourself. 
We'll but turn no, it into great. a gay sauna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please don't. But no, it, it is like that. Some places you go to, you fucking Google it. Because I am very much into that with the Scandinavian culture as well. I think it's it's cool, you know, like, I don't know if you want to call it appropriation, whatever. Fuck it, I don't care. But like, one thing that I always do when I'm in Norway is um, in, uh, I don't know if you know where uh, Drummond is, but that sort of near to oslo and yep. uh and that's like it's like maybe like an hour away and they've got this river running through town and they've got the sauna there we can go in the sauna you know and it's like what 80 odd degrees probably more depending on obviously how much water you put on the on the thing and it's fucking incredible you know and then you've got it there for like uh, over an hour it's like an hour and 15 minutes and then right next to it, there's the river, you know, and then you can be in the sauna and then you can do contrast therapy and then you can go jump in the water. And I, I just did it twice um, last week, whenever it was, I went there. And honestly, man, you feel so fucking good. You feel you feel high. It's like you just took a fucking drug, you know, but it's yeah. like nature's drug and it's cheaper and actually good for you. It's, yeah. it's nothing else. Like I've, I've always recommended like the cold thing, but, you know, the contrast between that and sauna, I think it's just so good for you and especially if you've been on tour you need it i know it's like very unromantic for black metal you know i, I suppose you know you prefer if you know like whoever's listening they would probably prefer to say something like oh yes yeah, so at night time you know when the show is done i go and sleep in a casket you know with like in, in a coffin you know surrounded by candles you know like king diamond in the 90s but you, you need shit like that you know just to kind of refresh yourself you know because when you're yeah, on tour yeah. Your microbiome and everything just completely gets fucked up, and then your whole body is just in a very weird state. Yeah, yeah tour, like... touring is terrible for your body. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. extreme sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one of the main reasons why I even got into fitness and weightlifting and things like that was because I realized that the way I was going before, I wouldn't have survived. Uh, playing too much because every time we were playing shows i was just getting destroyed physically and mentally and it would take so long to recover so part of why i even got into it wanted to make myself more robust was just so i can tolerate touring and playing shows more which i can yeah. you know be smart so you can be stupid longer yeah exactly there you very, go very man aware of you <laughs> yeah <laughs> no ex exactly you know i think you need that kind of staple you know like people don't don't realize how awkward it is when you don't have access to let's say you don't have access to a kitchen all the time you know when you're constantly surviving off of riders which you can't always rely on especially if you're in the uk you know the promoters are going to give you the yeah. worst fucking garbage you've ever tried uh, <laughs> but then if that's like if you know like the rest of it is just you know sandwiches or if you're in germany all you can eat is fucking fried sausages you know and that's outside of the saunas by the way and mm -hmm. uh you know it's like <laughs> 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 there's, there's out of experience. That's it. Wait, I, I, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> but the point being that you need the, you know, like it's like that takes its toll on you. You know, like all the nutrition and things like that that you, your body needs to survive and to function optimally just goes out the fucking window. Now, on top of it, put in the extreme and intense experience of being on stage every night. You know, and then doing that you know to you know pushing yourself to the absolute extreme every single night which by the way is exactly the reason why i 100 percent urge every person listening to this to make sure that they attend the tour that you guys are doing because you know that you're gonna get something that's 110 percent fucking intense and uh, there's no prisoners taken yeah and it's it's awkward if you were <laughs> doing a show and uh, you are like out of breath even before it's halfway through yeah that's, that's a, another thing which uh, kind of keeps us on the ground i think yeah like like not eating mcdonald's every day and not drinking 15 beers every day maybe sometimes go for just 12 yeah okay yeah fair enough and, fair enough. and uh <laughs> Go and nuggets <laughs> for a change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but you, you, you uh, if you take care of yourself the month before going on tour, you it's easier on the tour and get sleep. That's yeah, that's big... basically where we are at now. Yeah. We have a month now, yeah. which is time to get physically prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and you know what's the what's the part about that that no one ever talks about is how you feel when you come home from a tour and that you gotta go back to a normal fucking job. It's yeah, not I, fun. It's terrible. It's the post tour depression. It's terrible. I can find myself just standing watching in the fridge like why has no one filled up this? What do I eat today? Where do I go? <laughs> Who tells me what to do? Yeah, I have to put on an alarm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. Now I had that it, same experience back in um, March 2020 because we were doing like a UK run with Trivex, and uh, this was like I think our shows were between I don't know. I think the last date was like the 15th of March, and the whole country went into lockdown like later that same week or like a week after like it was a very short space of time and uh which was still okay because a lot of people were still coming to the shows which was i didn't expect that i thought that was pretty fucking cool but i remember i actually had covid on that tour i didn't know what it was so i had it fresh out of the wuhan lab version you know straight out of the oven and uh, that totally like fucked me up you know like i was really like destroyed but every night i was still like fuck it you know go on stage and i could feel my vocal cords just like fucking vibrating and getting like fried up but then i was still pushing past because i was like enjoying you know like when you get that threshold put in front of you there is a degree yeah. of enjoyment like pushing past it but it was just getting worse every night and then on the last night of the tour, I remember being in a fucking bathtub, just fucking staring at the ceiling, you know, like an empty bathtub, just fucking staring at the ceiling, being like, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, I'm just some kid from Iran. But uh, this was like when we had just finished it. And then when we came back, I don't know what the Iran thing has anything to do with that, by the way. But when we came back, um, I uh, we, we had another weekend planned after that. And then... I went to buy some food. I thought, okay, I can feel that I'm about to collapse here. I can feel that, you know, like the impending energy crash that's coming towards you. And then I went down to the fucking shop down the road and then there's no meat. I'm like, and, or toilet paper. I'm like, what the fuck happened here? Did I just miss the fucking apocalypse here or something like that? Because when you're on tour, when you're on the road, it's not quite as prevalent. I know with Miss Thurman, you guys kind of had a similar timing of the of a tour that you were doing, which you then ended up doing a live stream for. But I remember like fucking being so confused by the whole thing. And then literally I didn't after that tour, I didn't see anyone for like eight weeks. You know, it was pretty fucking shit. So, yeah, let's not do that again. No. <laughs> yeah. How was it when when you guys were doing that tour? When because um, then you ended up doing like a live stream uh, for it as well. Yeah, I can't remember another... if we talked about this last time, but it, it's we, good to bring we, it up. We we did. It's another tour we did without Bjorn. Maybe that's oh. uh, why it was cursed. <laughs> Actually, it all makes sense now. The two tours we did without Bjorn were like fucking mess. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we I think we talked about it last time but basically like they were closing all the borders uh behind us every day. Like we left the country entered another one and then the previous country closed their borders and it happened every day. It was falling like a, a domino behind us. Yeah. And then Estonia was the last uh last place on that tour last date and that was the only one that got got cancelled and the guys the organizers of the show were just really smart and responded quickly got some filming crew and set up a stream and we didn't have to do much more than what we did the other days just set up our gear do a sound check and play a show impressive yeah. And I think you did fairly good, considering all those circumstances. Like, the energy, you still somehow did it, even though there wasn't, well, too much of a crowd there. I guess you I guess you still had a few crew members, but you didn't really have a crowd there, did you? We had a cro crowd of, like, 15 people. So it was the crew, mm -hmm. and I think, like, they cheated a bit, like, invited a couple of friends. But they kept it, kept it like, no more than 15 in, in, the, in, that, uh, in that venue. And hmm. uh, yeah, that 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 really mattered to us. Even though it was a small crowd, it was still a crowd, and they were ch cheering us on, and it really gave us all the energy that you really need to to deliver a, 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 a convincing show. 
a fulfilling show, you know. Uh, and I, I think that's that's a very important thing as well, you know. I mean, for anyone listening, they would think, well, why do you need a crowd to perform better? But it's because it's not the fact that you're being watched, but there is this back and forth, this uh, this synergy that occurs between you and the crowd, you know, the, the energy. Yeah, and there's you know, a reason you for them. why you plan the show. Like that, exactly. that's another thing. Like you, if you were only doing this exclusively for yourself, you would just remain a, a studio band. That's uh, mm. pretty obvious, I think. And uh, because you give energy, and then you want energy back, right? And that fires you up. So it's an exchange of energy. It go dancing yeah, it, with the audience. It's yeah, it's a balance. Like every, both parties are returning the favor, and. Uh, yeah. The reason why I love playing shows, or the reason why I wanted to start playing shows, I mean, is because I loved going to shows myself and uh, sort of, I don't know, that's that sort of giving back to society what you got from society. Like you, you, you see, there's a scene happening, and uh, there's a crowd, and there are bands that have been writing music and rehearsing like maniacs and delivering a killer show and you have the time of your life in the mosh pit or whatever and then you can yeah like like i said like you return the favor when you form a band and you start planning shows yourself but when you see happy faces uh celebrating your show you're uh you're happy that they came and you're happy that the event took place and like uh, per, per, uh, just the thought of performing in front of cameras with no uh, crowd is uh, I I wouldn't even say it's scary it just sounds terrible like uh, boring ter- ter- terrifyingly boring like it's uh, that's not the point of doing a show <laughs> yeah yeah, for sure. It's all about the connection, isn't it? You know, it's the yeah. fact that you get to live and breathe these songs, but then you get to do it in people's faces, you know, and then there is that, like Bjorn put it, you know, that you give them energy, then they give you some energy back, and then you get to give them more, and then it's sort of like this heat and this tension that grows between the band and the audience, you know, it's almost sort of like, you know, you're you're having sex with the crowd's brains, you know, and it just sort of gets better as as it goes on hopefully anyway. yeah it just you could just have stopped at sex like it's pretty much like sex <laughs> yeah 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 no but it is yeah sweaty dirty loud you you don't want to keep fucking if you're not being fucked back <laughs> <laughs> exactly that's why yes. you want to make <laughs> That's that's why you want to make all the eye contact possible, you know, and you don't <laughs> yes. want them like scrolling on their phone in the middle of it or, or anything like yeah, that. And keep everyone hydrated. <laughs> <laughs> make sure the other guy is doing yeah. good too. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe at some point you want Bjorn to come in and take uh, <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> and speaking of which, I'm guessing that people can expect to see that on the upcoming tour, right? Well, we yeah. have been doing that for some time now, ever since Bjorn did the guest vocals on our second album. Hmm. Uh, maybe that thing is getting a bit tired for us. I don't know. We're going to do something. I don't know. Yeah, I got, gonna... text. I got a text yesterday with a suggestion. So something might happen. Yeah. Something yeah. might maybe happen. We'll stir it up. Mm. All right. All right. I mean, that is a great song, you know, and it's good that you know like when we get to see it you know we get to actually see both of you playing it together i believe that's track six of uh i'll play me right yes yeah yeah. great fucking song actually that's a that's a cool section i I love the lyrics as well you know it's uh i love the somberness of it and uh bjorn did you actually write those parts as well yeah i think i'm in uh, swedish so and they've now printed a shirt with that lyric on so very proud yeah i i, I kind of uh, almost feel uh sorry for uh leaving out your part of of the lyrics in the in the booklet in the album but uh i i had some like very thorough idea about um my parts of the lyric and uh Bjorn's contribution was 
fucking fantastic but i i somehow because it's like mixing three languages i thought it was like getting a bit uh confusing so i decided to keep the text uh only with my words but not to leave Bjorn out or anything like that it was just <laughs> an artistic choice at the point but uh Bjorn's ly- lyrics like i i asked him to do them in swedish which he declined until i i asked for the third time yeah and then he agreed to do the last part, like the last two, three lines, or four, uh, last four lines in, in Swedish. Yeah. So I was very happy about that. And I th- think it, it it sounds so fucking badass that I had to have it printed on the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty fucking cool. Bjorn, is that the only thing that you've done in Swedish? Yeah. Or wait. No, there there is a tape out there with that nobody knows about where I sing Swedish. I think yeah. until now, what is the tape? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, I will never tell. There you go. <laughs> okay then, cool. Well, at, at least at least we know that part, you know, because uh, I know yeah, you, you've always uh, done your stuff in English, you know, and I guess there's that um, maybe the last line of Gospel of Hate. That's is that in yeah, Norwegian? That's Swedish. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, some Norwegian in one tail one head. They mixed English and, and Norwegian. Sure. See, I'm a very cultured man. I I do understand these things and I do pay attention. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool, man. Well, um, listen, guys. I think now is perhaps a good time to tra- try and uh, wrap this up. Um, I mean, first off, it's been a fucking blast, and what a pleasure having you both here. Uh, it's been a good excuse just to hang out with you both, like we were doing uh, exactly this time last month, you know. But thank you both so much for coming on. Um, uh, so I guess let's do the the official roundup of things. Dagur, uh, do you have anything coming up? Anything you'd like to plug to the audience at all? No. No. Okay. Done. Not really. We're just doing that tour. We've been plugging that plenty. Yeah. That's a main focus point right now. Can't wait. And then, uh, so that's with uh, Miss Therming, Darvaza, I think, was it Hella Ruin? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Vrang. And Vrang. Okay. Very well. Very well. And, and for anyone, obviously, who's not checked out uh, either... Um, the Solan Varma album, or if they've lived under a rock and not listened to Meta, Meta Hamri yet, then now is the time to go and do that. Uh, and Ritual it, Death, of course. And Ritual Death, yes. So, Bjorn, do you have anything to plug at the moment? No, it's the same. Uh, playing with Ritual Death uh, in a couple of weeks, playing with uh, Mare in Prague Death Mass next weekend. Oh, yeah. And then it's the tour. We'll see if we survive this time. We shall see. We shall see. Amazing. Guys, gentlemen, thank you so much both for joining me. As I said at the beginning of the podcast, not only your fantastic frontman that I look up to and I respect, and uh, not only that, but uh, I'm proud to call you both friends. And thank you so much to both of you for your time this evening. I do really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. All right. And to everyone else listening as well. See you guys on the next episode. Hope you enjoyed this. Bye-bye.